Okay, the scripture reading this morning is really Matthew 7, 13 through 14, unlike what is in your bulletin. Um, so here we go. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This morning, we're going to look at this passage from Matthew chapter 7. Now, I am assuming, uh, guys, that uh, part of your training is, do you guys ever hike? Is that part of, the, uh, part of the requirement? So you guys have all been, you've never been hiking. <laughs> you guys go hiking? Well, I have been hiked, I have hiked in the Appalachian Mountains, I've hiked in the Rockies, I've hiked in the Sierra Ma- Madrid and... Uh, in Madrid, Spain, and so, and normally when you go hiking, what's one thing you really need? Well, that's good. Yeah, you should have some, you should have some food. Water is good, right? Uh, if, you're at a, if you're at a national park, what do they normally give you if you're going to hike one of the trails? They give you what? Very good, and why is the map important? There you go, because... It's a terrible feeling to get lost when you're out hiking a few hours and all of a sudden you think, I am lost. And that has happened a couple of times when I've been hiking, I have to say. I come to a place and you see on the map and all of a sudden I see two ways, but on the map it only has one way. And then you have to make a decision. You know, this morning Jesus is going to talk about two ways. Now today is one of the great sporting events in today, right guys? What's on today? Super Bowl, good. And we've got who's playing? New England and? Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, our Chiefs didn't make it. And unfortunately, the Rams got in by a terrible call. (laughs) But there is a player today who will be playing for the New England Patriots, and he's their quarterback. He's been playing since 2003. What's his name? Tom Brady. You all know who Tom Brady is? Is there anybody in here who doesn't know who Tom Brady is? Tom Brady has won three Super Bowls. He's probably going to go down in history as one of the better quarterbacks that ever played the game. He was on 60 Minutes a few years ago, and they were interviewing Tom Brady about his life and and what he does. And so on this interview, he talked about having three Super Bowl rings, and he showed them. He says, I have a beautiful wife. She's an actress. I have a great family. I have a beautiful home. I have everything that I would ever need. And then he made this statement that caught my attention. He said this, is this all there is? Is this all there is? One of the most successful NFL players, the one who has plenty of money, has everything he ever would need, and yet he made that statement, is this all there is? This morning in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is going to talk about two ways. He's finishing up his Sermon on the Mount. He has just preached to a large crowd of probably 10,000 or more. And he comes to the conclusion of his sermon, and he asks this way. He's going to say, folks, there are two ways. There are two ways, two paths. One's a broad path, and one is a narrow path. One is very wide and easy, The other one is narrow and difficult. What Jesus is talking about here is two ways of life. This morning, if you'd like to follow, I do have sermon notes in the bulletin. First of all, Jesus Christ, guys, is the narrow way. Jesus talks about this narrow way. Jesus commands this gateway is restricted. So he says the the narrow way is restricted. It's, It's smaller. It's not as wide. It's more difficult. And then as he goes on, then he says this, enter through the narrow gate. This is a command. It's an urgent command. It would be start entering because it's urgent. This is urgent. You don't want to wait. You don't want to say, well, maybe tomorrow or maybe next year. The urgency of entering into this narrow path through this narrow gate, Jesus encourages the folks to respond after his message. And then this narrow way, this narrow gate, the way is not easy. For he goes on to say, for the gate is small and the way or the path 
is narrow. What he's referring to is one point to the next. As you're normally going on a trail or a path, you're normally going somewhere, right? You're normally heading somewhere. You're not just walking around just to be walking around. Normally you're going from point A to point B. And Jesus is talking about how do we go from point A to point B. And he says, on this narrow way, he says that which leads to life, uh, which leads to eternal life, abundant life, he says there are few who will follow this. There are few who will follow this path because it's more difficult, it's more restricted, it's, it's not an easy path to follow. Well, the question that you should be asking is this. Well, who is the way? What is he talking about here? Is he literally talking about some path I need to go out there and find and start walking on? No. He is referring to himself. The way that Jesus is talking about is he is the way. Jesus would say in John 3.16, because God the Father sent his Son. And the verse... and this. This used to be a verse that everybody, if I, even if you didn't go to church, most people would know this verse. But today, that's probably not true. And it goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What Jesus is saying is this. God the Father, who created the universe, who's perfect, who's infinite, who was not bound by time space, he sent his son into a world that had rejected and disobeyed him. They had turned and went their own way. They had desired not the things of the Lord, but the things of self, the things that they like rather than things that God likes. And so as Jesus is talking about this narrow way, Jesus is going to say, I am that way. If you want to come to the Father, you must come through me. Jesus would say this in another passage. He says, I and the Father are one. You have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Three persons, but one God, unified. And Jesus says this, if you want to know the Father, you have to know me to know the Father. I and the Father are one. We are one and we are co-equal. We are co-eternal. We are one. And so as Jesus communicated that to his disciples and to those who were following him, one of them said, well, Jesus, how do we get to the Father? And Jesus looks at Philip and says, Philip, how long have you been with me? Philip had been traveling with Jesus for three years. Three years he'd seen his miracles. Three years he's, he has heard his teaching. Three years he has heard everything that Jesus wanted them to understand. And then at the end, he still has that question. Jesus, how do we know the way? Well, Jesus said this in John 14, 16. It's an easy passage to know. And he turns to Philip, and he turns to his disciples who are thinking, Lord, how do we know the way? What is the way? How do we follow the way? What is the way to, to, the, to the Father? And Jesus said this. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There is no other way beside me. Now, did you hear that? I am the absolute way. I am the absolute truth. I am the absolute life. There is no other way except through me. Now, that's a pretty strong statement, don't you think? You hear that, and you go like, okay, is Jesus saying... There's no other way, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Jesus, who is very God, who came to this earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, obeyed the law perfectly, did everything of the will of the Father, and the point was that he would live a perfect, sinless life so that eventually he would go to a cross, a cross which was a cruel instrument used by the Romans, for punishing crim criminals. It was one of the worst ways to die. It was, it was just a painful death. And yet the reason Jesus went to the cross was for what reason? To die for my sin and to die for your sins. You see, Jesus Christ is the only way. 
So why do I need Jesus Christ? You're saying, well, okay, Jesus, he's, I've heard of him. Have you all heard who Jesus is? Now, sometime in our culture, sometimes I wonder. But I would think everybody's heard about who Jesus is, right? Or at least you have some idea who Jesus is. You've heard a little bit about him. Well, this is who Jesus is. Jesus came, and it says in Romans 3.23, we all have sinned against God's holiness. In Romans 3.23, it says this, guys. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. All have sinned and fall short of God's holiness. God is here, and we are here. And the only way we can come to God is through the work of Christ. Jesus Christ died for my sin. He rose again. He's now seated in the heavenlies on the right hand of the Father. He will be coming again. We do not know when, but he said he is coming. And so here, how can I come to a perfect holy God? when we have disobeyed God. And some people might say this, well, you know, you might look at your friend and you say, well, I think he lies more than I do. Or I think I've seen him steal something. Or I've heard him say a bad word and I don't do that. So I'm better than him. Well, the analogy would be like this. Think of it this way. You say, well, I'm not as bad a sinner as somebody else. And yeah, there are some pretty bad sinners out there, right? Okay? You can think of friends, you can think of kids, you can think of adults. But God looks at it this way. Let's say I have a baseball here. Okay? You all know what a baseball is, right? And so we're going to have a contest. We're going to say, we're going to see who can throw the baseball the farthest. And so we all get a baseball. I played baseball in high school and college, and at, during that time I could throw it pretty long. And so I say, okay, I can throw it this far. And somebody comes up and says, well, I can throw it farther than that. So they throw it farther. And somebody else comes up and they can throw it a little bit farther. Then I say this, well, here is our target. The target is Chillicothe. Who can throw a baseball from First Christian to Chillicothe? And the answer to that is what? No one. I don't care if it's the top pitcher in Major League Baseball. I don't care if it's the top outfielder. I don't care who it is. They can only throw it so far, and they will not reach Chillicothe, right? Well, that's the way it is with us. We might think, well, I'm pretty good, and, and I don't cheat, and I don't steal, and I don't lie, and I don't say any bad words, and certainly God would want me in because I'm pretty good. But we have all sinned. The Bible says that we have all sinned. All have sinned and fallen short. All have fallen short. All of us, all of us have fallen short. But there is a remedy to that. In this, we break God's law and are accountable before God. God put the law in place, the Ten Commandments, to show us exactly that we break God's laws and therefore we are not righteous, we're not holy, we are not perfect. The Bible says this, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those, us, who are under the law. So that every mouth may be closed or shut, and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh, none of us, will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You know, when we think about the law, the Ten Commandments, don't covet, don't steal, um, don't commit adultery, uh, don't worship any other god besides God. And we say, well, I haven't done any of those. But here's the question. You might not have done them outwardly, but how about doing them inwardly? In our hearts. In our hearts. Jesus says if it's in our heart and we desire to do it, we've still broken God's commands. And therefore, that puts us in a serious condition. But here's the good news, guys. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. In Romans 5, 8, you want good news? Here's good news. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for me. When I was 18 years old, I committed my life to Christ. I'd grown up in church. I was a very moral person. I did everything my mom and dad told me to do most of the time. And I was one of those good kids but I knew in my heart that there were some really bad things in my heart that I wasn't doing. But if, if I wasn't scared of my mom, I would have. <laughs> my mom basically uh, said, you will be sorry if you do certain sins. <laughs> and she meant it. 
And so I was afraid. But the point was, I had sin in my heart. And that's why Jesus, when he calls us to himself, he calls us to follow him. Jesus calls us to follow him. That is the narrow way. The narrow way is to come to Christ, to place our trust and faith in what Christ did on the cross for us so that we could have eternal life, be forgiven of sin, and have the promise of eternal life in heaven. That is the way. But we do live in a culture. That's why Jesus says what? There is a narrow way, but he also says there is a broad way. He says, for the gate is wide. It is wide, very wide, and it's broad that leads to destruction. First of all, those doing their own thing is on the broad way. Let me explain it this way. Many people follow this way, okay? If you would talk to the average American, and if you would ask them, and I've asked this question, I said, okay, why should God let you into heaven? I have talked to probably thousands of people over a time of my ministry. Why should God let you into heaven? Inevitably, normally, this is their answer. They will look at me and say, you know what? It's like a scales. We got our good stuff and we got our bad stuff. And if our good stuff is better than our bad stuff, certainly God will let us into heaven. Well, let me tell you something. That is not in this book. <laughs> it's not in this book. Because what did I just say? We are all what? We have all sinned and fall short of God's righteousness. It's not my good works that are going to get me in. And in the, on this broad way, there's plenty of room. And there's a lot of people who are following that way. It's the easy way. But then this broad way leads to, as Jesus says here, to destruction. Proverbs says this, there's a way that seems right unto man, but the way thereof is death. You see, if you follow this broad way and do not place your faith and confidence in what Christ has done for us, this way will lead to separation from God, darkness, and an eternity away from God. And it's not a place that we'd want to go. And yet when people continue to live contrary to God and not desiring the things of the Lord and not desiring his son, there are two ways. One is the way through Christ and the other way is doing it my way. And in this way, we see that on this road, all beliefs are the same. Um, we live in a culture and you've talked about, um, you talked about the Boy Scouts, changes in the Boy Scouts, right? And I could take a moment here and go through some of those changes which I desperately believe are, were not good along some of those. But our culture says this. Our culture has this mindset. First of all, the culture says there's no value judgments. It says this. Whatever you believe, that's fine for you, but don't do what? Don't tell me what I'm doing is what? Is wrong. Our culture says, look, this is what I believe and don't tell me that what I believe is wrong or what I am doing is wrong. You see, that is a culture that is running in a moral muck. It is a culture that says, look, and I can go through the list, which I won't do this morning, but I think you understand, is that our culture says, don't tell me that this is wrong because this is the way I want to do it. And yet God says, what you're doing is wrong. That's why here in our culture, when it says there's no moral absolutes, everything is right in man's own eyes and women's own eyes. And as we look at this culture that discusses certain moral issues, and they say, look, uh, whatever you feel, whatever you like, whatever's your thing, then do it. But please don't put any moral judgment on anybody else. Well, my friend, God has made the statement that he has made an absolute. And we can say it's like this. How many legs does a dog have, kids? Four legs, right? Do you all believe that? Dog has four legs. Well, what if I told you this morning that a dog has five legs? And I'm going to tell you that you guys call that thing that wags behind the dog a tail, but I'm going to call it a leg. And I'm going to say a dog has five legs. And you're all going to look at me and say, what? That's crazy, right? Because I can talk, call that tail a leg all I want, but it doesn't make it a what? It doesn't make it true, right? Well, that's our culture. 
There's a lot of moral issues that they say, this is not wrong, this is not wrong. But God says what? It's, it's wrong and it's a sin against him. And then there's plenty of religion on this, on this trail. What I mean by that is this. As we walk along this path, a lot of people like to say, well, I'm very what? I'm very religious. I go to church and I give and I'm pretty good and I've been going to church. And yet a person can go to church and not know Jesus Christ. It's like this. People think that religion, again, if I am very religious, certainly God will love me. No, it's not about religion, folks, families and kids. It's about trusting Jesus. People can be very religious and not know Jesus. You know, this morning when Tom Brady made that comment, here's a man that has all the money he needs. Here's a man that has a beautiful wife. Here's a man that's won three Super Bowls. Here's a man that's probably going to win his fourth Super Bowl today. The Rams probably don't have a chance. New Orleans, I'd rather see that game with uh, Drew rather than watching the Rams. But that's it. And so here's going to be Drew Brees. I'll be honest, I'm not a big New England fan. I'm not a big Tom. I'm not a big Belichick fan. But they're there and they're successful. So they're going to be playing today, and Brady's going to be playing for his fourth ring. And after it's done, guess what? Brady's 41, I do believe. Somewhere around that. That's pretty old for a football player, isn't it? But you know what? He's going to come back and play again. Because four Super Bowl rings isn't what? Enough. How many Super Bowl rings do you need? Five, but then if you get five, what else do you need? You want more. And that's why he's going to keep playing so, until some lineman takes him down where he won't be able to play anymore because he doesn't have what? He doesn't have peace in his life. He doesn't know. It's like this. Um, when I was pastoring in, the, in Madrid, Spain, okay, Spain over in Europe, and I had a friend who gave me his testimony. His name was Adrian. Um, Adrian told me the day we... In Spain, we had a group of men we loved to hike. We would hike six, seven hours once a month. We'd go up in the mountains. We didn't have any maps. We'd just go. And sometimes that got us in trouble, but sometimes, most times not. And so Adrian went hiking with the pastor that was before me at this church, the Emmanuel Baptist Church. And so they went hiking. And so in April in Spain, it could be 72 in April, and by the end of the day, it could be 30. That's how much of a temperature drop. And so they went hiking, didn't take any maps. They just started off, and they knew they wanted to go to this one place where there's a valley and there's a small river, so they wanted to hike down that river. And then they were going to swing up around and come back. And so as they started hiking, they got to the place as they were hiking. They were about four or five hours in. And they were still looking for that, that area where the, the gorge would be broken and they could swing around. But as they went, they couldn't find the gorge. And so by this time, as the valley was narrowing, they were now hiking through knee-to-waist-deep water because now the banks were like this. And as they walked this river, the river began, began to be a narrow, and they continued to go, thinking they're certainly going to find a place where they can take the right and swing back, but they couldn't find it. Now it started getting darker. The temperature was getting colder. Now they realized that they were in, you know, they were in sort of a mess. Because they'd already hiked so many hours, they still had water, but they didn't have any food. And they, and they had, they would have to climb about the length of the ceiling to get out of that gorge. Now that doesn't look, and you're tired, you've been hiking for five hours, and it wasn't, it wasn't straight like this, but it was enough. It was, it was a little bit dangerous. And so they came to that point where Adrian and Calvin, they started to pull themselves out of that gorge. Calvin was probably in his 50s. Adrian was in his late 20s. So they got about two-thirds up, and Calvin just falls down on a ledge and says, I give up. I'm done. I can't make it any farther. Adrian, you're just going to have to climb up and go find help. And Adrian knew that as it was getting colder, they were wet, which was not going to be a good idea. And so here is Adrian. Now, here, Adrian, he was an agnostic. An agnostic is one who says, well, I don't know if God exists. I really don't care, and God doesn't care much about me. Adrian was a biology teacher at one of the top schools in Madrid. And so this guy, here he is on this ledge, he's soaked and wet, it's getting dark, it's getting colder, it 
guy who really didn't believe in God, and all of a sudden, Adrian just lifted his hands up to the sky and says, Oh, God, save us, please. So he turned over to Calvin and says, Calvin, come on, we've only got another 20, 25 feet to go. Let's do it. And so both of them were exhausted, tired, and as they got to the top of that, that great little valley, they looked across, and guess what they saw? Out there, there was their car. Their car was over there. But from their perspective in that valley, it looked bad. But who gave Adrian strength? The Lord did. And when he came back to church, that next Sunday, he came to church and he committed his life to Jesus Christ. He said, Lord, you have been good to me. I've been ignoring you, denying you, but I know you are true. You have been one who has given me strength, and I commit my life to you. And he committed his life to Jesus Christ to follow Jesus to God's glory. And you have been very, very godly. This morning, as we finish, guys, um, I want to challenge every one of us this morning. I want to challenge every one of us this morning that, first of all, God loves you. He cares very much for you. He came. He died for our sins so that we can have life, that we can life, have life, eternal life, resurrection life, and life with our Father in heaven. And, and this morning, that is, a, that is not a complicated thing. We're going to take the Lord's Supper this morning. And the Lord's Supper doesn't save us. Taking this, this juice and this piece of bread doesn't save us. But it is an emblem of what Jesus has done. Uh, if we say in our hearts, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need you. You paid for my sin. I know you rose again. Come into my heart. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. And give me life. God promises to do that. And that can be done today. It can be done at any time. But Jesus says, urgently, follow the narrow way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank you for these families. I thank you for these Cub Scouts and these Boy Scouts. I thank you for their leaders. I thank you, Lord, that they desire to, to instill in these young men values and things that are important. I commend them for that. And Lord, I pray they continue to do that. But I also pray, Father, that um, we need Jesus Christ. We need him as our Lord and Savior.